So we're back. We're back. Do you remember who we are from the long, long ago? I don't. You know, well, I'm Ailey and you're Kieran. I'm Kieran. Mm -hmm. From the Genuinely Spooky podcast. (gasps) I've heard about that. Have you? Yeah. So have lots of other people. (sighs) Isn't that fun? (sighs) Very fun. And now we're back with a mini series. Yeah, we are. In between season one and season two. Yep. Coming to the end of summer. Sort of. It's the end of like the school summer holidays, which is always a an end of summer in my head. It always feels like the end of summer when the schools go back. Yeah, even though, you know, it's been a long time since that was anyway applicable to me. Yeah, it's been like ten years, but you still feel it. Yeah. How have you been? How's life? Good. I've been so excited to record. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so long. I know. I've got, I missed it. I missed it too. Because, you know, we don't talk if we're not recording. No. We live completely independently of each other when we're not recording the podcast, so this is good. We can catch up. Opposite ends of the house. Yeah, we can hang out. Yeah, it's nice. How have you been? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the COVID catch up. What's new? Nothing. Yeah. I haven't seen you in like two years. What's going on? Ah, you not know. much. <laughs> <laughs> no bad yourself. Oh, no bad, no bad, eh? <laughs> Well, cheers. Cheers. To the miniseries. To the miniseries. We both have my grandest whiskey glasses, and I'm having a Dram Beauty, and you're having a Stag's Breath. Yeah, oh, which is very tasty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Will you tell the people what Stag's Breath is? I'm just going to rattle in there. Oh, it sounded uh, gloopy. Why did it sound gloopy? Uh, I think there was an air bubble under an ice cube. <laughs> it is a honey whiskey liqueur, and it's very tasty. And I've saved this, like, dribble at the bottom of the bottle for... At least a year, if not two years, Mm. since I last had some. Because it's really tasty and I didn't want it to run out. I'm pretty sure I said in the bottle that it's made from fermented honey comb. Mm. Not just honey. Which is interesting. Yeah. It's kind of like a mead, isn't it? It's more like a mead, isn't it? Very tasty. It's not for me. I'm not a honey fan. No, you're... I am a whiskey fan. Almost allergic to honey. Yeah, it's weird. I get a weird feeling in my throat if I have honey. Yeah. It gets all, like, achy and itchy. Mm Mm-hmm. But mine's 20% alcohol, and yours is 40% alcohol. I'm getting drunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be slurred by the end. Yeah. But, you know, keep it in. Because this is the mini-series. This is the party zone. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this mini-series? Well, if you listen to our season finale from season one. I know, I did. The, you were there. I know, but I edited it, so I listened to it through. Oh, okay. I love it. If the people listened to our season one finale about Loch Ness and the Loch Ness Monster, then you will know that this mini series is three parts and is all about the history of witchcraft in Scotland. Interesting. I think it's really interesting. I am super pumped. Yeah. It's like the epitome of spooky history to me because it's equal parts interesting and absolutely horrendous. Well, it's. It's witches, you know? That's That's got to be spooky. Mm-hmm. Is it going to be gingerbread houses? Oven doors slamming? No. Kids it's, being fattened up? No, it's going to be way worse. Oh. Hubble bubble boil and trouble kind of thing? Kind of that, but you might just be thinking of Macbeth. I am not thinking of Macbeth, yes. <laughs> when shall we three meet again? And all that. <laughs> it's living so close to Cotter Castle, it's had an impact on you. Yep. We're going to see Macbeth next month at yeah. Cotter Castle. An open air theatre. I'm yeah. so excited. Should be good. Well, this is our special mini series that we've put together on witchcraft in Scottish history. And this started just as an ordinary episode. This was going to be episode seven. I think seven. Seven or eight. Of season one. And we changed our minds because it just. There was too much to cover in one episode and it just didn't feel right. So. We saved it, and now you have a three-part mini-series to help you through the the drought of content. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a very generous royal we from Ailey, because, you know, we have prepared this. I don't have anything to prepare. 
<laughs> I said a mini series might be fun, and that was it. And then I did all the work. Yeah, then you've done all the research and the script writing. I'll do work after. Well, see, that's the thing. We have a really good balance of work. It just so happens that mine gets done first. Yep. So you feel bad for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and then you edit, and I feel bad for a bit. But then the episode comes out, and it's all it's all gravy. Yeah. And got some good feedback, so you seem to be enjoying it. <laughs> so yeah, everyone that's reached out after... <clears throat> excuse me. After season one, we really, really appreciate it. Like, any nice comments? The people who've left reviews on Apple Podcasts, they're so lovely. Thank you so much. And yeah, just all your nice messages and all your nice comments are really, really appreciated. They've they mean more than you know. Yep. All warm and fuzzy inside. Oh. And it's not just the Tramp Beauty. <laughs> so these episodes, these three episodes, are going to be chronological. So we're going to be talking about witchcraft in Scotland across history. So I've, I've tried to do it in a way that makes sense. <clears throat> but this isn't a complete or comprehensive you know, account of witchcraft in Scotland. It's such a huge topic and there's so many things to talk about that I kind of had to narrow it down just to give us a little a little skim over, over this period in history. So I've chosen three figures from sort of the witch hunts and witch trials in Scotland to help me talk about it all a bit more generally. So we have kind of a like a lightning rod in these figures to then talk about what the witch hunts and witch trials were like, if that makes sense. Makes sense to me. But this is such an interesting topic that if you're even a little bit interested in in this generally, definitely look into it deeper. There's there's so many books and podcasts and films and TV shows. You'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready? Uh, uh, yeah. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. So today we're starting our journey with Agnes Sampson and the North Berwick witch hunts. Ooh. Did she get her hair cut off and lose all her strength? No. Hmm. You're, you're a bit too far back. <laughs> we need to reel you back in. Is she of that line of Sampsons? No. Hmm. Oh, mate. That's there. <laughs> <laughs> Agnes Sampson was known as the wise wife of Keith and she started working as a healer and a midwife around 1585 so we're at the end of the 1500s for this episode is this Keith the place? yes okay yeah not wife of Keith yeah who's Keith? <laughs> <laughs> no Keith the place and a lot of the articles I read referred to Agnes as a cunning woman, mm. in quotations. Which I don't think means what we would mean now if we called someone a cunning woman. It didn't mean that she was, like, sly. Mm-hmm. Um, it meant she was knowledgeable and she knew a lot about healing and natural remedies and things like that. Mm. That's what a cunning woman was. That's interesting. I thought so. One you... of those phrases that just kind of falls out of the lexicon. Yeah. Lexicon's a good word also. That's a good, like... It's like a $15 word, lexicon, <laughs> if I had to attribute a value. Because <laughs> you definitely picture, like, cunning and deceitful. Yeah, They're yeah, that's of... that's the difference. She wasn't seen particularly as deceitful. She mm-hmm. was clever. And there is a slight difference in the connotation. Yeah, because you imagine, like, the proverbial snake that's wrecking shit. Yeah. Or Scar from Lion King. <laughs> <laughs> Curveball there. <laughs> Agnes was from Nether Keith, which is just outside Haddington, which is all in East Lothian. So that part of Scotland. Which is towards Edinburgh. Yes. But no one's quite sure when she was actually born, which is something that happens a lot in these stories. Records are patchy, it's difficult to tell. What we do know is that at some point she was married, but then she was widowed. And she had children at some point. She was a mother. But we don't really know any more details than that. And like a lot of women at this time, being widowed made things really, really difficult for her financially. There's very few options you'd have as a widow to earn enough money to look after your family if the man of the house was no longer there. And she struggled, but like I said, she made a lot of her money 
from working as a healer and a midwife. So that was how she was supporting herself. She was helping people in her community and getting paid for it. Sounds very noble. Right? Nothing nothing wrong so far. No, nothing wrong with that at all. And yeah, she helped a lot of people in her community from all different walks of life. So there was nobody who, in their time of need, was above going to see a cunning woman. So she, she was visited by people like Lady Edmiston mm-hmm. and Lady Kilbaberton. Kilbaberton. And Lady <laughs> Roslyn. And I know all of these people's life stories, obviously. I'm just glazing over for the sake of, of brevity. Naturally. naturally. I'm, I'm totally kidding. They were just minor members of the aristocracy who lived in the general area. Well, they're ladies, not Ms. or Mrs. or anything. Well, the point is, they, they were major figures in their community. We mm-hmm. don't know much about them, but in that small place, they were a big deal. And they were going to her for help. So obviously she was doing something mm-hmm. right and Agnes would help with lots of different things. She would create powders that helped women get through childbirth. They would help them cope with the pain. Because, you know, I've heard that that's pretty painful. Um, I've not heard great things. <laughs> <clears throat> She'd soak eggs in vinegar and iris. You know, the flower? Oh. We've got them in the living room just now. We the, do. The purple and yellow ones. Oh. Uh, she'd use that to help her to cure illnesses. <laughs> Misc illnesses. Misc illness of sucking a vinegary egg. I don't even know if you'd have to suck on it. She just soaked them in vinegar. Or maybe that was just on your behalf. Maybe. Smooshed mm. over a bruise. I don't know. I'm obviously not a cunning woman. I don't know. <laughs> she'd also make lotions with whiskey in them that she'd rub on her patient's body to help heal them of afflictions. Which may have some something to it. Could do. Could be like like deep heat and things would just yeah. make the area very warm. Yeah, or maybe some kind of like antiseptic with the alcohol. Oh yeah, yeah. But these these all seem fairly harmless. They're mm-hmm. just remedies that would help people with what they were dealing with. But there were other things that she supposedly did that people thought were a bit more dodge. Mm. Sorry. In. Terry Pratchett, I'm rereading one involving the witches, which is always a good time. Uh, they always help young blushing maidens come in to get potions for their husbands and end up smiling a lot after they receive them. <laughs> so that's what the witches do. They provide lots of just Viagra potions and, like, the pill. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a noble cause in its own way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is that what she did? No. Mm. No, if someone came to her and they didn't know how serious their illness was, so if they didn't know how unwell they actually were, she would do this chant over them. And it was a version of the Apostles' Creed, which she had adapted to suit her. And this was a problem for a couple of reasons. The first is that the Apostles, I don't know if you know, the Apostles' Creed is a statement of faith. It Mm -hmm. proves your faith in God. So that's the purpose of it. But it's also a Catholic prayer. Okay. So it's it's a Catholic thing. And this was at a time when Scotland was converting to and moving to Protestantism. Mm. So it's not like it's a Jersey thing. No. It's a it's bit a, more serious than it just a being Catholic a Jersey thing. thing. It's a Catholic <laughs> thing. And that's, that's a whole situation I'll get more into later because it's relevant to the story. But this was an issue that this was a Catholic prayer that she'd adapted mm-hmm. and was using. But she would chant this prayer over the person who didn't know how ill they were. And if she made it all the way through with no mistakes, it showed that the patient was going to live. Yay! (laughs) Well, that's good. I know. But if she made a mistake, it meant that they were going to die. Oh, that's... That's a shame. Which is a bit brutal. Because I can definitely see that being like a a self-fulfilling prophecy type deal. Yeah, absolutely. That if you thought you were going to die, you wouldn't take the steps to get well. No. So, you, you know, this is the 1500s, so you might die. There's a lot there that can kill you. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, that was one of her techniques oh, that no. she was up to. Another thing she did, which concerned people, was she used wax figures to cast spells on the people that they mm. were made to look like. So you probably know this just about witchcraft lore generally, that this is a thing. For one woman, she apparently used a wax figure to kill her father-in-law for her. Obviously, these are all stories. It's not a fact. Uh 
I'm not saying that she actually did all these things and these things happened, but these are the stories that were going around about her. And as usually happens in stories about people accused of being witches, everyone was happy to use Agnes for healing and to solve all their problems for them while it suited them. But eventually the tide did turn against Agnes. Which isn't her fault. She's only doing what people ask her to help with. But, you know, it's kind of an inevitability. People are terrible. Yeah, that's that just sounds about right, doesn't it? Everyone's stoked on you until the tide turns, as you say. It's kind of like fame. Like, everyone is super hyped about you until they're not. Mm -hmm. Until you hear Bill Gates is getting a divorce and you're like... This guy? Who's he trying to save the world? Yeah, Kieran's been struggling. Hmm. I'm a fan. Or I was. Now I'm confused. <laughs> he's, he's having a time. He's having a hard time. Yeah. Anyway, in 1589, Agnes was accused of being a witch by the Presbytery in Haddington. Now, the Presbytery is a group of church elders from the Presbyterian Church. And they represent all the congregations in the local area. So it's kind of like a you know, a group of the elders, like a council. Mm -hmm. And the Presbyterian Church was strict in that scripture ruled your life. So therefore, church elders held a lot of power. They had a lot of sway in the community. Gotcha. Agnes was accused, but she ended up being released because they couldn't find any reason to prosecute her for anything. (laughs) It was kind of like they were just hoping it would work out the way they wanted but they had nothing that would actually make a prosecution stick. Even at a time where accusing someone of witchcraft was pretty easy. Well, yeah, I'm surprised they didn't just make something up. Yeah, like, they had they had nothing. They had nothing. Didn't even have someone to come in and be like, she turned me into a newt. No. <laughs> I got better. <laughs> so they did what they should have done. They released her. But then the Presbytery started getting hassled by their higher-ups for not charging her with anything. Oh, man. Even though they had no evidence that oh, she yeah. did anything wrong. Ah, we know she's not innocent. Not what we checked and she's innocent. No, but we know yeah. she's not innocent. So they were treated by their... I don't want to say bosses. It's not quite the right <laughs> word. But they were treated like they were just allowing a witch to perform evil in the community when they're the church elders and concerned with saving the souls of everybody. So, you know, it's messed up. Really mm-hmm. messed up. So the Presbytery were pushed again in May of 1590 to do something about Agnes, even though there was no evidence she had done anything wrong. The higher-ups actually sent two ministers from Dalkeith to Haddington to assist the Presbytery with Agnes. To assist. Mm. Bit suspicious. Bit suspicious. So by Halloween that year, Agnes was in prison. <laughs> On charges of, I just fucking know you've done something wrong. Yeah, it took six months. Mm. She was in prison. Mm. She'd been profiled. (laughs) She'd been selected for a random search. Yeah, just targeted. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was later in 1590 that another woman from the North Berwick area, Galus Duncan, gave up Agnes Sampson's name after being interrogated about who was a witch in the community. And by interrogated, and by interrogated, I mean tortured by her boss for information. So she wasn't just asked; she was she was tortured. Yeah, and that always gives good information. I know historically, it's always so reliable. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And so this is the beginning of what would become the first big witchcraft trial to be tried under the Witchcraft Act of 1563. This was the North Berwick Witch Trials. Hmm. Quite a while after, 27 years. Hmm? It was 1590, and that was... Oh, yeah, yeah. The first major one. Um, I've been looking into it all a bit more generally, obviously. And the, it kind of happens in batches. You get these, like, yeah, just batches of witch hunts that mm. happen all together in witch trials. So they just happen in these little groups, and then there's none for ages, and then they happen again. So it's, it's really bizarre. Strange. But before we get more into it, we need to get into the history a little more and into the monarch of the time, who was King James the Sixth and First. Hmm. We have to look a bit more generally and spookily. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> we don't. Are you sure? Yes. Because <laughs> we can do that. I don't want to. <laughs> 
James Charles Stuart was born in 1566. In Edinburgh Castle, no less. Mm, can't trust a Stuart. Eh, excuse me. <laughs> That's my maiden name, if you didn't know. Kieran's being a dick. Yep, I love his bed. <laughs> his mother was Mary, Queen of Scots, who is someone who definitely deserves her own episode. So I'm not going to get too much into what her life was like, mm-hmm. because there's just too much. But it was after his cousin died, an obscure woman named Queen Elizabeth I, that James became King of Scotland, King of England, and King of Ireland in the Mm. Union of the Crowns. Now, this was a big deal, because before this, Scotland and England had had separate sovereigns, separate crowns. They weren't the same thing. So he was King James VI of Scotland and King James I of England. Yes. That's why he's both. So James was made King of Scotland first, and he was only 13 months old when this happened. Mm. And this was because Mary, Queen of Scots, his mum, mm-hmm. abdicated. Oh. And she didn't have an easy reign. You know, I, I won't get into it, but she had a really hard time. Yeah. And he didn't really have a relationship with his mum. He was raised by several different regents. You know, noblemen who would have absolutely no reason to influence the young king in any way for no. their own personal gain. Well, why would they do that? I'm sure they're all just stand-up gentlemen. They're like, this is a young lad who needs guidance. Yeah, I, I hope you know I'm joking. Because they were totally using and manipulating the king to get what they wanted. Obviously, obviously. Because power. power. Yeah. <laughs> Mainly what they wanted was an obedient Protestant king. Now, remember I said the Protestant Catholic thing? Mm-hmm. Would be, this is when we're talking about it. Mary had been a Catholic queen. But the Scottish Reformation meant that Scotland broke away from the papacy. So they broke away from the Pope and Catholicism generally. Got you. I'm sorry if this is all getting a bit much. I swear it's relevant. It's all going to come around. And it's useful to know. (laughs) So James was raised to be a good, obedient Protestant king. But that does not mean he was a good person. Mm. Because the two are not, you know, they're not the same. No. He became king of England in 1603. And he promised that since he was also the King of Scotland, he promised he would return every three years for the good of his people. You know? I mean, that sounds reasonable. Doing the right thing. Because it'll, it'll take a while to get from London to Edinburgh. So. But he's the king. So. You know, even travelling style, but like he's not even travelling. I know, but he's probably busy in things every three years. Well, okay, okay, it's not overcommitting. Seems reasonable. He visited once. <laughs> in 1617. And that was it. He never came back. <laughs> Fuck Scotland, am I right? But there, well, there's a lot I could say about how this echoes with our current governmental situation, mm. but I won't. <laughs> it was through James's reign that the plantation of Ulster happened. I don't know if you know what that is. No. The process of people from southern Scotland and northern England moving to Ulster to colonise it. Oh. Because, you know, the people there are... Inept, apparently. Uh, can't just do things themselves. Or about just Ulster again? Ireland. Oh. So, you know, chill. Yeah. Very chill. That's fine. That's it, fine. It was also during his reign that the colonisation of the Americas started. Oh, yeah. So that's fun. You know, have you heard of that? <laughs> <laughs> that excellent time in history. Yeah, you all know that just amazing things happened when white British and European people moved to... The Americas. Moved it anywhere ever. Yeah, just good times for everybody. Mm. Mass genocide. It's totally chill. It's totally chill. It's fine. Don't even worry about it. In 1604, James tried to give himself the title of King of Great Britain, but the House of Commons wouldn't let him. (laughs) And he ended up, you know, being desperate and kind of like throwing the dummy a bit. And he forced the Scottish Parliament to use it. Very nice, very and nice, you know, you know what they say about people who give themselves nicknames? Mm. It's never, it never ends well. <laughs> You're just trying to be cool and it just doesn't work. Yeah. You know, like, you end up calling yourself the Rossitron and <laughs> so everyone hates it. <laughs> the Rossitron. So it makes more sense when you think about the fact that King James was the king that Guy Fox tried to do away with. With the gunpowder plot. Oh, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think he did it for all of those reasons, but, you know. Probably did it for his own selfish, power yeah, hungry reasons. Fair game, fair game. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> I can't remember, I think it might have had something to do with the fact that he was a Protestant and they didn't want that anymore. I, 
can't quite remember. I thought they did want Protestants. Well, generally, yes, but I think he might have been part of a group that wanted a Catholic monarch. Ah, got you. Because, you know, not everybody agrees with everything. Didn't you know that? What? What? People fight all the time. Oh, no. All the time. Over what? Just anything. Everything. Yeah. Different flavours of the same thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Mm-hmm. King James was the one who sponsored the translation of the Bible into English for the very first time. The King James Bible. Yeah. You see? I think from Latin. I think it was in Latin before. That would make sense. And he did it to try and consolidate his power. So he's doing this great thing. He's translating the Bible. He's kind of in control of how the translation goes, yada yada. He wanted to bring everyone together Mm -hmm. so that he was monarch over a united people because he wanted to be king of Great Britain. A united kingdom. Exactly. I wonder if anyone else has cottoned on to that. (laughs) (laughs) But that didn't really happen. He didn't consolidate his power. He ended up democratising the Bible. Um, and more people could access it than ever before because I'm sure it was Latin. If you didn't read the language that the Bible was written in, you couldn't read the Bible. Yeah, because it used to be only only the minister or whoever, bishop, I don't know, could read the Bible because he would read it to you. And that was the only exactly. way you could like, receive the information. And, you know, if he's not reading it, if he's just basing a sermon, it's his interpretation of the yeah. words. So, you know, I was saying that Presbyterians take scripture very seriously. Mm-hmm. So, the, you know, this is a big deal that anyone can read the Bible. And yeah, it's the King James Bible. A lot of people have seen that and maybe not appreciated that that's where the name comes from. Well, it's just a, just a thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's just, it's it's so common. It's like yeah. the most, it's sold the most copies of any book ever. Yeah. Something silly like that. James was actually pretty power hungry, if you would believe it. What? I know. He fell out with his parliament loads because he felt like they weren't giving him enough money. (laughs) You know, as king of everything. And he kept dismissing them. So he kept dismissing parliament. They weren't allowed to work. And he actually sold off a whole load of titles for money since parliament weren't giving him what he wanted. Very nice. So he created titles and ways to get into the nobility with the sole purpose of selling them off. Classy. Class E. Right? There was, I can't remember what it is, but there was something the Catholics invented and they'd give it to the Templars or the army and it would excuse them for murdering people. And there's Ooh. a name for it. It's a little like, it's like a pass. But it's like, okay, you can commit this sin because it's for God. Is it a hall pass? It's not a hall pass. It's something else. It has a, it has a name. I think it's a hall. Well, they had these hall passes that they give to the Templars and the soldiers and stuff who would go off and commit atrocities. I guess that makes sense, because that would directly conflict with their faith. Yeah. Like, Especially if this was, it was like a mission of faith, wasn't it? Well, yes, thou shalt not kill, but okay, you have to go and kill these people in the name of the Lord. So here's a pass, and hmm. now you can do it for free. And then they went, well, we could just sell these to people to just excuse them of sins. So wow. they just started selling them, and you could just buy, buy, a, buy, a, buy a pass. I never knew that. Yep. I can't remember. It's a, it's a well-known thing, or like a well-known phrase. A whole pass. <laughs> I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's not a whole pass. I mean, they made a movie. They didn't make a movie about that. Like, it's a thing. Yeah. It'll come to you. It'll come to you like, in between recordings, and you'll shout it at me. I know. I'm, I'll put it And somewhere. then you'll need one of the passes. <laughs> For all my swearing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, maybe he stole their idea. He's like, maybe. Oh, the timings, I don't think, quite work out. But it probably is. It's a pretty, pretty standard idea. It's I not think that he probably ingenious. just knew that like everybody wants power and oh, yeah. recognition. So, on that basis, people would buy yeah, that's it. <laughs> a title. Anyway, James also spent a lot of time trying to civilise Highlanders and Islanders, Ooh. which might make you happy to hear. <laughs> Doesn't managed. <laughs> I mean, I think we're living proof, aren't we? <laughs> we have met up with quite a lot of people since like lockdown's finished. I'm very like acutely aware of how much I swear compared to everyone else in conversation. <laughs> we, should, we need to stop. I know. I think it's because we swear a lot just with each other. Just at each other. Yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't... We're getting so off track mm. now. I wouldn't consider myself a sweary person. I just swear when I'm with you. Well, yeah, neither did I, but oh... 
Oh my god. Oh, oh shit. Yeah. Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, fuck me, right? <laughs> Stop it! Okay, okay. King James. Yes. He made several attempts to bring the leaders of the Hebrides to heal. So we talked a bit about what historically islanders were like. They were fiercely independent. And for a long time, the Kingdom of the Isles was separate to the rest of Scotland. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, there's precedent for that independent feeling. It's always been that way. Uh, But he got rid of the Lord of the Isles title, which was ancient, and it meant a great deal to the society that was built around it. It was a way of life. Mm -hmm. So people were pissed. Naturally. And he did all this, and he treated Highlanders like they were beasts and uneducated. And he tried to abolish Gaelic. He treated it as if it was completely foreign, had no place here, even though it's the native language for a huge section of the country. Mm -hmm. And his first language was Scots. Remember, he was born in Edinburgh. Oh, yeah. So English wasn't his first language. Scots is its own language. And he still tried to abolish Gaelic. Outrageous. So he was an arsehole. And reading about all of this made me very angry. Yeah. So I'm glad he's dead. (laughs) (laughs) Arsehole. He also had really big ideas about how powerful and great kings are. And he believed fully in the divine right of kings. Oh, no. So that's believing that kings are just, and you know, not queens, kings. Naturally. Are just higher beings than the rest of humanity. And that they actually owned their entire kingdom. So it's not that they were (sighs) the figurehead or the representative. He believed that as king, he owned all of the land that he ruled. Which is, you know, it's a slight, subtle difference, but it is a difference. It's a, it's an important difference, though, yeah. isn't it? So, you mm. know, he, he, it's all his, all belongs to him. As far as his legacy goes, he ended up leaving his son what I saw described as a fatal belief in the divine rights of kings combined with a disdain for parliament. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess would be fine, you know, parent the way that you see fit. But his son was King Charles I who ended up being executed for being deemed a tyrant. Very nice. And we're going to talk about him next episode. Oh. Like a little bit. So not the best parenting. Definitely could have taught his son a little bit of grace. Yeah. A little bit of humility. Yeah. Might not have been executed. You know. But Ailey, we've been talking about this for hours. What on earth does this have to do with witches? Well, I'll tell you. Was Was that my voice? Yeah. Oh. That was you. You just asked me. I did. In 1589, King James married Anne of Denmark. And she was the daughter of the King of Denmark and Norway. So they're they're separate countries, but he's the king of both. Mm-hmm. And they actually had a proxy marriage, which was like fairly common. So they weren't even in the same country when they were married. It's weird. And the, like the register, the certificates and things were signed by people for them. <laughs> or... Maybe not. Maybe they signed it, but separately. They signed it and then emailed it over? I don't think they did that. I'm fairly confident. Okay, okay. Facts, maybe. (laughs) But when the young Anne, she was about 14 at this point, you know, totally chill, when she tried to sail over to Scotland to be with her her blushing groom, she couldn't. Mm. She left Denmark, but the voyage was ruined by these really terrible storms. The ship had to turn back to Norway. That's a shame. So James was upset. You know, he did all this work to get himself a wife. So, you know, he expected the delivery and it didn't come <laughs> on the day that he expected. I know. He got his mail order bride. Yeah. And she she didn't appear. So Region. James James sailed over to Norway to collect his wife. <laughs> and that's when they actually got married because mm. they were together for the first time. So they travelled to Copenhagen back in Denmark And this was significant because James was exposed to the Danish royal court. Mm -hmm. And this had a profound impact on him. He was... The Danish court was completely taken over with the fear of witchcraft and black magic. Oh. And that was all happening while he was there. And he got completely swept up by everything he saw. He was completely taken in by this... Almost like hysteria Mm. over, over witchcraft. They were really afraid. In 1590 it was time for the newlyweds to sail back home to Scotland. But as soon as they left, there were these huge, terrible storms again. 
and they had a really terrible voyage. It was really unsafe, you know, just terrible. You're, you're, you know what that might be like. I know. I've lived by the sea a long time. Storms oh, are bad. Being, being on the sea in bad yeah. weather. It's not, it's not a good time. So James became convinced that their ship had fallen victim to witches. Oh. You know, he'd been surrounded by all of this. They convinced him that this was the truth. So he believed that the storms were supernatural. They weren't, they had, didn't just happen. It's not just the North Sea. Well, yeah, I wonder how they... Oh, is it? That is the North Sea. Uh, I think so. I'm not sure. I'm anyway. forgive my C's. <laughs> my B's and D's are better. <laughs> that was really bad. Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wonder how they explained every other storm ever. Were they all witchcraft or were some of them witchcraft? Well, you have to wonder what makes them different. Well, Is it the timing? Yeah, it must just be this one's affected me. Yeah, as the king. Yeah, so it must be on purpose. Especially if you have a divine or like a, a divinity to you. So of course you're going to like get cam seas and things. God will allow you safe passage. because you're... I just learned about witchcraft, so it's definitely witchcraft. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. He probably knew about it before yeah this isn't the first instance of witchcraft i wonder how different it would have been if she had made it on the first time if he hadn't gone to denmark i don't know because oh, we're kind of getting ahead but the general hysteria around witchcraft in europe and britain was already ongoing mm-hmm. and it was a tool that was used by monarchs to show how good they were mm-hmm. and how they were getting stuff done. So I feel like with his general attitude to life, I feel like he would have fallen into it anyway. This was just the reason yeah, that he that. chose. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to say though. Yeah. Don't know. Curious. Back in Denmark, rumours had started flying about James and Anne's ship being cursed and everyone was wanting to know who did it. And <laughs> It, I know <laughs> the weather <laughs> <laughs> oh no 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 six women ended up being accused of being witches naturally and as is usually the case these women were imprisoned they were likely tortured and they ended up confessing that they had cast spells to raise the big storms <laughs> that James and Anne had sailed through and they even confessed to sending devils to climb up the keel of Anne's ship madness mm-hmm. just a weird thought though what if they did do that and there just happened to be a big storm? Ooh. That'd be pretty weird, wouldn't That's it? That's a tricky one, isn't it? What if they did cast spells to try and sink the king's ship and then just, you know... That's tricky. Mm. That's very tricky. That's okay. I've never considered that in mm. all the witch trial things. Like coincidence. Yeah. But they're, they're going like, oh shit, it actually worked, but we didn't do it good enough because he didn't die. Mm. When? Interesting, that's interesting. Yeah. Probably. So maybe they were guilty of ill intent. Yeah. But not execution. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Well, two of these women were burned for being witches. Ooh. So they were taking these accusations and the confessions from these women really seriously. It was a big deal. Mm-hmm. And James knew that all of this had happened back in Denmark. And when you mix this with the obsession that he developed over black magic and demons something's coming (laughs) and he ended up setting up his own tribunal to try people accused of witchcraft that was what he channeled his passion into excellent destruction (laughs) mutually assured destruction (laughs) the witchcraft act and the scottish witchcraft act were both introduced in 1563 so just under 30 years before James set sail for Denmark. So that's oh. why I'm saying that like, this isn't the first. The, oh, okay. It's kind of his introduction or his first involvement. But, yeah. you know, these laws were brought in under, like, Queen Elizabeth I and everything. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So it at most stoked the fire. Yeah, yeah. It didn't start the fire. We didn't start the fire. <laughs> these laws made witchcraft a very serious offence. So we might laugh about it now that, you know, it's ridiculous to think that these women cast storms and tried to kill the king, Mm -hmm. but this was a major crime. In England, you could be put to death if it was found you'd caused someone harm through magic. Although 
if you hadn't actually hurt anyone, you might get a lesser sentence. Hmm. So it depended on what had actually happened rather than what you meant. That's fair. But it was different in Scotland. Hmm. In Scotland, practising any kind of witchcraft or even consulting with a witch meant death. Oh, Oh, because in the first case, if those women had intended to create a storm to sink the ship and nothing had happened, but if I know they'd intended to, they'd be like, stop it. (laughs) Stop it. (laughs) Do some community service. Get ahead of here. Well, I don't know. It's a bit treason-y. Well, I suppose that specifically is a bit Mm treason-y than just trying to set a storm on someone's husband who's a dick. Yeah. Yeah. You might... Well, in England, you might get away with it. In Scotland, you would not. No. If you could spell the word witch, you were dead. Mm. So King James was going to use these laws and his new tribunal to root out all the witches in his kingdom. And I said it already, I've got it in my notes again here, but a lot of kings and queens hunted witches to prove how godly they were. And it made them look better to everybody if they were finding and rooting out and killing all these witches. I can see the sense, but horrible. It's horrible, but you can see why they did it. Yeah. I'm not agreeing with it. No. I can just see how they got from A to B. (laughs) I can see why it seemed like a good idea at the time. (laughs) Yeah. I read other sources that even said that he hunted witches because it was a way of... I say legitimately, with air quotes, legitimately targeting communities of women who he felt threatened by. Mm. Because if you're able to accuse large groups of women of this terrible crime, and, you know, these groups have influence and power in their community, you take away all of their political influence. Yeah. Either by, you know, killing major members or scaring them. Yeah. So someone else can step into the space that they leave and do things in a way that better benefits the king. Useful, useful. You know, fishy, mm-hmm. bit fishy. Mm-hmm. The Game of Thrones continues. <laughs> so anyway, James returns from Denmark. He's heard all about the witches in Denmark, but he doesn't believe it was just Danish witches that attacked his ship. Oh no. He believed that they were also Scottish witches to blame. Mm-hmm. Not just the Danes. Who would obviously know when he was sailing from obviously. Denmark. Obviously. They clearly have access to that information. To Google that. Boom. Google Maps. Yep. <laughs> Shipping forecast. <laughs> well, do you know, Kieran, which place in Scotland has a cracking view of the North Sea, which would be ideal for casting spells on a ship? Berwick. North Berwick, baby. North Berwick. North Berwick, baby. And this is what brings us all the way back around to Agnes Sampson, who's just been accused of being a witch by Galus Duncan. Just before she gets her haircut. No, it's not talking about the hair. It's not relevant. You're going to confuse people. Do you remember who I'm talking about? Yes. Okay, right. The reason we're here. Yes, we're back. Agni Sampson. We we took a little bit of a loop, the scenic route, but yep. we're here. Took a, little, took a little bit of a sail to Denmark, sailed on back, and we're here. <laughs> well, Galus Duncan had a very bad time, and Galus Duncan is actually the name of an Outlander character. Who is also accused of being a witch. Oh, interesting. Fun fact. Definitely on purpose. I would say so, yeah. (laughs) Galus was tortured by her employer, like I said. And her employer was a man called David Seaton. Who, you know, sounds nice. He tortured her because apparently she suddenly had healing powers that she couldn't explain. And when he pressed her about them... Oh, no. She suddenly had healing powers that she couldn't explain when he pressed her about them. Mm -hmm. And she was leaving the house at weird hours of the night. So he didn't have answers for these things, so naturally tortured her into confessing to being a witch. Obviously. But I do find it a bit coincidental that James returns from Denmark and he has his suspicions about witches being in the area, living by the coast. And then this man, David Seaton, who obviously had power and money, you know, because he has servants, Mm. decides to help the king out and says, here's a witch. Well, yeah. I found one for you. I live by the sea. There's a witch in my employ. In my house. Yeah. You know, it's a bit... I don't like it. It stinks. 
Mm. Trying to curry favour, maybe. Yeah. By getting rid of someone he doesn't really care about. Yeah. So Galus was tortured and she confessed to being a witch. But what was worse than that, you know, because she dogged herself in. Mm -hmm. Worse than that was she gave up a lot of other names, too, Mm -hmm. of people in the surrounding area who she said were also witches. And this is the list that included Agnes Sampson, who was already in prison. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I'm with you. You're with me? We've come all, all the way around. Mm-hmm. So she was in prison oh, by no. Halloween, and Galus has said independently that she's a witch. Mm. But it's, it's, it wouldn't even take that much for you to be accused of being a witch. No. Like, that seems pretty damning, but it didn't take a lot. A lot of people were being tortured over it as well. Yeah, that's the sad thing. Give them a name. Oh, here's a name. Well, we're not going to torture you. Stop torturing you until you give all the names. Okay, there, here's some more names. Can you just stop already? Mm-hmm. Mm. So, you know, it could be anything. Are you left-handed? You're a witch. Are you an elderly woman? You're a witch. <laughs> Are you a widow? Then you're probably a witch. Do you live in a gingerbread house? You're, you're a, witch. a witch. But you notice that the groups of people that I mentioned can't really stand up for themselves. Mm-hmm. They're already vulnerable and could genuinely be disliked. You know, like elderly people, like they can't, they can't stand up for themselves. No. So everyone knew that being accused of being a witch was really bad. So you might be sitting there wondering why anyone would confess to that. Like why, why would you put yourself through the pain? Torture. Well, yeah, I wish I could say that I'm happy to tell you why people might confess to a crime they didn't commit, mm-hmm. but it doesn't make me happy. Mm. It's really grim. So be ready. Buckle up, buckaroos. Yes. Lots of different techniques were used to force witches to give themselves up. And obviously I'm saying witches with the air quotes, since I don't believe that these people <laughs> did anything wrong. But, you know, that was the mindset that they were going for. We have to force these witches to tell us the truth, mm-hmm. even though that's not what they were doing. No. They, they wanted the story as they understood it. A document was published in Germany in 1486, so about 100 years before Agnes Sampson is in her cell. Mm -hmm. And this basically became the handbook of every European person who wanted to catch a witch. Now, this actually existed. Damn. It laid out exactly how you could spot a witch, how you could hunt down a witch, and how to interrogate a witch. And it was called Malleus Maleficarum, which basically translates to the Hammer of Witches. Ooh. That was a very good sounding name. Malleus Maleficarum. Mm-hmm. Not a good subject. But... No, it's just so horrible. It's yeah. really brutal. Germany actually had the biggest witch trial that we know about. And it was called the Trials of Trier, oh. which I may be saying wrong because it's German. You just shouted. <laughs> <laughs> no. Almost 400 people were executed. Ah, the German one. Mm -hmm. In this one witch trial. Holy shit. It was the biggest mass execution in Europe that wasn't related to a war. Jesus. Isn't that insane? That is insane. So accused witches could be hung from the ceiling by their thumbs. They could be shackled using heated irons that were put on their legs. Yep. Pass. If you're listening to this and you've ever burnt your hands or your neck with your straighteners or your curlers, it's a lot worse than that. So just think about that for a minute. I have not. You have. I have. It's very painful. <laughs> Especially if you get your ears. That's Ooh. really sore. If witch hunters believe that an accused had the devil's mark, which is usually just a birthmark mm-hmm. or something to that effect, then a needle would be used to stab it to see if the person felt any pain. What does that even mean? Well, the basis being that if they didn't feel any pain, that was the devil's mark that he had given his servant. That makes sense. No, it doesn't. (laughs) (laughs) Well, because they didn't know, like, do they want them to feel something? Do they not want them to feel something? It's kind of arbitrary. It doesn't doesn't even matter. That's the worst bit. Yeah. Well, actually, no. The worst bit... (laughs) is that I read in a different witch trial, there was this man who was searching out witches. Mm -hmm. And he actually, he's a cheeky bastard. He actually had a spring-loaded needle that would retract when it touched someone's skin. So no one ever felt any pain 
who was apparently stuck with this needle. God damn. How awful is that? So awful. That he had that. Because you, I'm pretty sure if you were like a witch hunter, you got paid. We had paid per witch. Yeah. So he had this needle that was rigged for failure. Brutal. Awful. Awful. Sometimes accused people would have their thumbs tied to their opposite big toes. And then they would be thrown in a river. No. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Because, oh man, that'd be so uncomfortable. Oh, oh, it's bad to worse. Mm -hmm. So if they floated on the river, they were a witch. So they would be put to death. Ah, yes. If they sank, then they had no access to oxygen. So they were effectively put to death. Even though that meant that they weren't witches. No. I wonder what tiny percentage of all the accused witches were actually witches doing black magic and trying to kill people with magic. I'm not saying they ever managed because it wouldn't make any sense. But when there's all this hysteria about like witches doing all this evil, there's got to have been at least one or two being like, holy shit, I think I'm a witch. I can do all this evil. I can undo all these wrongs. I think it's the twisting of traditional healing methods and just ancient traditions Mm -hmm. that have no harm not really and they've been twisted into something else Mm -hmm. that suits the agenda like I don't it's difficult to explain because it's so confusing but that's what I think I think it's just the twisting of things that have existed for a long time that were suddenly unacceptable Mm mhm so people kind of lost the knowledge and they were seeing things they didn't understand. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Things that most people would have known turned into things that nobody knew. Yeah. Like now, you know, there's certain professions or ways of doing things that have been completely forgotten. You know, like joinery by hand. A lot of things have power tools and things. Now. Mm. You have no concept of how people used to do stuff. Yeah. Well, even now, if you're like, oh man, I've got a sore throat out in a walk. And someone picked up a herb and went, chew that. And you chewed it and then your sore throat went away. You'd just be like, what the fuck was that? Mm-hmm. How did you know? You just picked up a random weed. So um, it becomes something else when you don't understand mm-hmm. it. That's what I think. Well, that's what I think as well for the majority of the cases. But I, still... I don't know if I think about it for the majority. I think the majority were just victims of prejudice or just greed. Oh yeah, sorry. That's, that makes it the word. But the ones who were actually doing witchcraft in the air quotes were just like doing as you were saying but I reckon there were some people who were like you know making their little dolls and trying to do bad things use black magic but I imagine that was like three (laughs) well I mean you're going to find bad people in any bunch aren't you yeah like and if you've heard all these all this like oh, there's witches tried to bring down a storm on the king. You'd be like, holy shit, there's this immense, crazy power. I'm like, I'm a terrible person. I want to harness that terrible power. So I'm going to try. I wonder if it was more focused on, like, shitty husbands. That's what I imagine. Or, like, jealous wives. Yeah. I wonder. All sort of like a kind of vigilante justice to Maybe. It. Maybe. There was a woman... This isn't even remotely related to what we're talking about now. (laughs) But there was this woman in... Oh, God, I can't even remember now. It's a European country. Mm -hmm. And there's this woman who created her own poison... Oh, my God. ...that she just gave out to women to kill their husbands who abused them. Like, that, that was a thing. There was, like, a marked rise in the deaths of men in this village... Christ. Because they were all awful, like beat their wives and cheated yeah. on them and all kinds of stuff. So they just start killing them with this poison that she invented. Man alive. Well yeah. there you go. That's a that's a black magic witch. Well yeah, like that's a bad thing to do. Yeah. You can't can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> is that much... is that a plea or <laughs> what have you been you up to? You can't do that, Ailey. <laughs> if you I, I don't know that it's a big Bailey Syrian thing. She talks because the poison was called Aqua Tafana, and it's something that she says all the time. So if you if you watch Bailey Syrian's YouTube videos, then you know what I'm talking about. Oh. I can't remember any of the details. I need to look them up again. In what context does she just say that? 
Yeah, she does a video about the woman killing everybody. Oh, I think it just became one of her catchphrases. It did, but that's why. Oh, but like, how would she use it as a catchphrase? Just like... Use it in a sentence for me. I don't know. (laughs) Well, like, she has another video about a nurse who killed lots of her patients using a blend of morphine and other things. Uh, She was like, oh, she aquatophaned them. That makes sense. Does it? Is that... Well, I I was forgetting the kind of things she would talk about, that it would be very contextual yeah. quite a lot of the time. Yeah. Like, like if someone's in a position where they need to get rid of their husband, then she might say that they need Aquatofana. Yeah. Hmm. She brought her a nail polish called Aquatofana. Very nice. I feel like I've said it too much. Aquatofana. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, do you want to hear about a couple of torture devices that I read about? Uh, yeah. Sure. I'll keep it brief. I'll try not to go into detail because it is horrible. One of them was called the Scold's Bridle, which could be fitted over a person's head and there was a piece of metal that would be fixed into the person's mouth to stop them talking. We saw one. I was just about to say. We went to the National Museum in in July Mm -hmm. and they have whole exhibits about King James and witchcraft and everything. And we saw one. We did. It's a scold's bridle. It's awful. Blech. Husbands were actually allowed to use these on their wives oh, if they felt like they were nagging. <laughs> Hence, Aqua Tafana. That's why it exists. <laughs> God damn. Fucking men. History just makes me angry yeah. sometimes. <laughs> men make me angry sometimes. <laughs> <clears throat> and then there was... The Breast Ripper. Oh, no. Yeah. It had four levers. It was made of metal. And it fit around a woman's boob. And I feel like that's all I need to say. I mean, you can put the rest of the details yeah. in yourself. Because I don't want to say them. So no. that was a thing that existed. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> After Galus accused Agnes, Agnes was taken to Edinburgh. And she was jailed there in November. And in December, Agnes gave a detailed confession of how she was a witch and she told them all about the witchcraft that she and others had done in North Berwick. <clears throat> and she confessed to all kinds of things. She said she'd attended a devil's convention on the Isle of Barra two years earlier. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> it's just so absurd. <laughs> it's not like VidCon. <laughs> I mean, I, I've never I'm been here. I don't know. <clears throat> She also named two other people who had gone to this convention, but they had already been executed as witches. Mm. So I don't know whether that was a calculated maybe effort. Like, mm-hmm. oh, well, they're already dead, so no further harm can come to them. Well, yeah, we know you were with people here. Oh, well, I have to say someone's name. You know, it mm-hmm. seems like a wise move. She also confessed to performing witchcraft with all the other witches in the area, on the grounds of St Andrew's Kirk, which is still standing in North Berwick. You can visit it. It has a great view of the sea. Hmm. She said that she saw the devil riding in on horseback, wearing a black hat and robe, and that he had a register and he ticked everyone's name off. <laughs> <laughs> and they all swore loyalty to him, and they showed how much they admired him with, quote, an obscene, ki- an obscene kiss, unquote. <laughs> Gasp. I feel like she was encouraged into a lot of these more lurid details that appeared in her confession. Because they happen a lot. Yeah. And they make it easier to show that she's a terrible person and she's grotesque and disgusting Mm -hmm. because she has all these horrible things. Like later, they described how they found the devil's mark on her, quote, privates, unquote. But this wasn't true. It was just published to make her look like a bad person. Yeah. Because... Well, they can't go around executing good women, can they? Well, no, but it's just, it's a weird relationship between women and sex Mm. and sexual activity that if you have any sexual activity, you're a bad person. Yeah. So they did this a lot and it cropped up again and again. So I feel like she was encouraged to say this type of thing. I mean, I believe it. Agnes also described how Galus played the harp while they danced in the grounds of the church on Halloween night. Mm. And she also confessed to digging up bodies to use the bones in her spells. And she was taught how to do these spells by the devil. So that was very distasteful. People learning she was digging up bodies and bones. Yeah, that's fair. But things would get even worse for Agnes. Because 
she they asked her about the storms that King James had experienced, mm-hmm. and they asked her outright if she was responsible. And she went, "No, you fucking moron." <laughs> And she mentioned them, but she explained that the devil had told her that there were ministers plotting against the king. Ooh. So she never conv- she never confessed to causing the storms, but she just mentioned them. But that was enough to get King James' attention, and he attended her trial personally when he heard that. Was this the one time he came to Scotland? No. <laughs> this was in 1590s. This is before he's King of England. Ah, got you. He was King of England in 1603. Ah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then he came back to visit in 1617 for the last time. Oh man, he's got a while to go, yeah. I know. (laughs) He has to deal with us for a bit longer. All in all, somewhere between 70 and 200 people were rounded up from the area around North Berwick. Jesus. Which is not a big place, especially then. And they were all accused of being witches and for plotting against the king, which is a serious problem Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's King James with the divine right to rule. So if you're plotting against him, you're a dead person. Yeah, that makes sense. Some of them confessed to casting spells on his ship. Others admitted trying to poison him or to poison members of his court. Agnes' story is really just one of many, and that's even sadder. Mm Mm-hmm. It's not just one person. It happens over and over and over again. One of the other women who's accused, Barbara Napier, was charged with conspiring with witches. So she wasn't charged with being a witch. Remember I said that in yeah. Scotland it's, it's a problem? She supposedly went to Agnes for help and for remedies for her health. And even though she wasn't actually found to be a witch, King James, the shit, pushed for her to be burnt and publicly disemboweled. Oh, God. She wasn't even a witch. No. Or witch. You know. <laughs> I'm not saying that... The other were. Homework, yeah, but yeah. you know, like, that wasn't even her charge. And no. that's what he, the king of everything, is pushing for. Fuck. Awful. Awful. You've probably guessed already, but Agnes's trial didn't go well. Oh, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> she confessed to 58 of the 102 charges brought against her. So she has no hope. No And she was convicted of being a witch on the 27th of January, 1591. And that meant she was sentenced to death. Brutal. Mm -hmm. The next day, so 28th of January, she only had a day from sentencing to punishment. She was strangled and then burned at the stake on Castle Hill in Edinburgh. And that was a common practice in Scotland, apparently people they were strangled before they were burned and I'm not really sure why and like burnt at the stake maybe it was just unpleasing for all the spectators to hear her screaming in agony for several hours I really don't know I don't know what the what the thinking is there oh good or it was to stop her casting spells on the crowd that were watching maybe or something ridiculous don't know just horrible but again on our trip to Edinburgh we walked past the fountain That's outside Edinburgh Castle. That's been placed there in memory of the women who were, mainly the women, but people, Mm -hmm. who were accused of being witches. It's still there. You can visit it. And it's it's on Castle Hill. So I don't think they know exactly where it all happened. Makes sense. But they've they've got a fountain there that you Mm -hmm. can go visit. The North Berwick Witch Trials were one of the largest in Scotland. But they weren't the first and they weren't the last. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more in the next episode, but over the course of Scotland's history, there were five great Scottish witch hunts, mm. and the North Berwick Witch Trials made up part of one of them. Part of one of them? Yeah. Damn. Because remember I said they happen in batches? Oh, yeah. So there's these, but they're happening all over the country at the same time. Oh, I, I assume this was a batch. Kind of, but... Not quite. No, this is some of the batch yeah. across Scotland. Oh, mm-hmm. About 4,000 people were executed in Scotland for being witches. Like, total. Unreal. 4,000 people. Scotland's one of the smallest countries in Europe, but we have one of the highest numbers of executed witches. I think I read that our numbers are about five times higher than other countries when you 
Like, look at the ratio. The counter size. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the population was at the time. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't looked into that. I mean, it's like 7 million now. So even 4,000 is a good chunk of that. Which I bet some people laugh at if they hear that the whole population of Scotland yeah. is 7 million people. <laughs> it's like half of New York. Yeah. But yeah, like, ratios-wise, then we have one of the highest out of any country. Crazy. Between 1500 and 1660, anywhere between 40,000 and 100,000 people were put to death after being accused of witchcraft, like globally. It's like I was saying before, it it was a hysteria. Mm -hmm. It it took over Europe. It took over the world. There was the Salem witch trials, which are hugely Mm -hmm. famous. And they happened much, much later. They happened in 1692. Oh man, a hundred years later, yeah. it's still ongoing, and it's still like a like a mania. Yeah. Like granted, the Salem trials were kind of, kind of at the end. It Thank all, goodness. It all kind of stopped. I think it was seventeen thirty five that the witchcraft laws were abolished, mm-hmm. so you couldn't try someone for being a witch anymore. So that's like forty years later. But, you know, like, that's a long time, considering this isn't the first. No. It's, like, 200 years, 300 years of just mayhem. Yeah. Absolutely mayhem. And that's not even getting into the witch, ha- the witch hunting that still happens today. There's a problem in some countries and some societies that people still believe that witches are real. Well, I was just wondering. I was wondering if it's still ongoing, like, globally. Mm-hmm. It does It does still happen. It's frightening. Yeah. After the North Berwick trial, King James continued with his witch obsession. It didn't end. And he wrote and published a book called Demonology in 1597, in which he discusses the dark arts at length. And I'm pretty sure there's an original copy at Codder Castle. Oh, really? I'm sure they have one. I need to check. I'm not sure. I mean, it's pretty historic, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I think they have a copy. And, you know, Macbeth witches. Yeah. Codder, like, there's a link there. Oh, I have it in my notes. The Witchcraft Acts weren't repealed until 1735. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it was coming, but it was a long time Mm -hmm. of just pain. I think witch trials generally say a lot about us as humans and as societies Mm. rather than telling us about the people who were supposedly witches. Yeah. To a point, anyone who was disliked in the community could have been accused of being a witch. If it was things like, they're left-handed. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, like this in North Berwick, it happened when Catholics weren't trusted or respected and everyone was supposed to convert to Protestantism and mm-hmm. that had a role in who was a witch, even though it was just a, a, a thing. Like mm-hmm. It's just how people felt at the time. Because remember, Agnes supposedly recited the Apostles' Creed over her patients. Oh, yeah. Which was a Catholic chant. Mm-hmm. So... Ruffling feathers. Well, blending these two things together kind of kills two birds with one stone for the witch hunters because there was never any proof that Agnes was a Catholic. But if you're part of the group who's saying, no, Protestantism is what we have to do, she's a Catholic and a witch. Yeah. It makes her worse. God. Even though it's kind of arbitrary. Well, yeah. A huge percentage of people accused of being witches were women. So... You can't talk about witch hunts and witch trials without talking about misogyny to some degree. Mm. You know, because deciding women were were witches was a way of crippling their power in society. Yeah. So there's horrible motives for everything at every point. I forget that men were accused too. I'm always surprised every time. Yeah, it did happen. Mm. It was a smaller percentage, but it, it was a thing. I won't get too much into it because I could go on and on and on. And we have two episodes to go. <laughs> but the common view of witchcraft has changed a lot as time's gone on. So it's what we were saying, that it's never consistent. It suits what the people in power need it to be. Mm-hmm. So in medieval times, they believed that there were two schools of magic. You had the natural kind, which you just use by understanding the world. Mm-hmm. You know, like healing and plants and everything. And then there was the demonic kind. And this was evil. But there was the natural kind of magic, which was fine. Yeah. There were two. So magic wasn't inherently evil. No. So you could be what people in North Berwick thought was a witch, 
But in medieval times, you were an important member of the community because you could help people. And then it changed in the 14th and 15th centuries. So suddenly, if you were a witch, you were given your powers by the devil. Mm -hmm. Because that was new. That hadn't really been a thing before that. No. And, you know, witches were out to destroy any followers of the Christian God. They were devil worshippers, which is entirely different. Yeah. Rather than just being healers. I wonder how many communities just shot themselves in the food. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, she's a witch. Oh, get rid of her. Oh, man, thank God she's gone. Oh, I'm really sick. Oh, I can't do anything about it. Yeah. Oh, there's no one I can go to help me. Oh, I'm just going to die then. there is someone I can go to help me, but if I get caught going to them... I'll be yeah. killed. It just—it feels like moving the goalposts. It feels like you can't win, mm-hmm. and it's just—it just suits whoever's in power. Mm-hmm. And that, I think that's what makes it so frustrating. And I think that's why people still talk about the witch hunt so often because it's just—it's just so agonising and frustrating in everything. <laughs> Absolutely. It reminds me of the moving the goalposts of the story, the one of Ron, John Ronson's books. Uh, I think it's John Ronson. He's a writer, yeah. Yeah, and he's in the... I've forgotten the correct word for it, but the mental home. The like, mental institute. And there's someone in there he's talking to who's been deemed as crazy. And... Oh, yeah, he's talking to the psychopath. Yeah, that was it. He's... I think that's a prison. I think he's in prison, isn't he? Oh, no. Nah. He's not allowed to leave. I think he's been um, sectioned. Oh, I thought he was in, like, a... Well, I'll, yeah, yeah. there's one where he's in prison, but the one I'm talking about is, he's saying like, yeah, they're just like, they're convinced I'm mad and I'm not fit for society. And whatever I do, like, they say I'm doing the opposite. Because he appears in like a three-piece suit. And like, yeah, like, I was dressing in just like the kind of pyjamas they give me. And I saw them writing their clipboards. Makes no effort in appearance. So I'm like, oh, well, I'll put on my nice suit. So I turn up in my suit and they write, makes too much effort with appearance. And just... Whatever he did, no matter which way he did it, they said it was a problem that he was doing it. So he was stuck. Yeah. But, even then, John Roth was like, yeah, but in saying all that, I don't know if he shouldn't be in there. But it's definitely just like, oh, you're doing that, you're a witch. Like, oh, well, I'll do this instead. Like, no, you're doing that, you're a witch. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's just who you are as a person, you can't even change it. No. You can't, or to a point, you can't help being left-handed. It's a lot of work to change being left-handed. You can't help being old. (laughs) You can't help it if your husband dies. So it's just... Brutal. So I've had a hard time researching this miniseries because there's lots of stories like that. I'm just like, oh, why? (laughs) (laughs) But that is the long and full of tangents and side road story of Agnes Sampson and the North Berwick Witch Trials. <laughs> grim. It is grim. I made I made no promises at the top. I told you this was going to be grim. No, and there's no... I mean, it's not going to get better from here in the next two episodes, really, nope. is it? No, no, no. Very, I just tune out now. Skip, wait for season two. Uh, I've put a lot of work into these. <laughs> Yeah, I can't even blame you if you've listened to this episode and you've decided <laughs> that this isn't for you. I can't even get mad. Pack up your notes. Yeah, because it's it's not easy. No. But that makes it important to talk about. Exactly. Well, before we go, I'm going to quickly look up and see if I can find that thing that the, the priest saw. Oh, the hall pass. Yes. <laughs> How annoyed are you going to be if you look it up and it's actually called a hall pass? I should get a prize, really. I mean, I think so. I think that'd be fair. I don't even want to look up. Um, Maybe just a pardon. Indulgence? Might be an indulgence. In the teaching of the Catholic Church, an indulgence is a way to reduce the amount of punishment one has to undergo for sins. And they stopped selling them in 1567. Must have been an indulgence. You can get one for yourself or for someone who is dead. You cannot buy one. The church outlawed the sales of indulgences in 1567, but charitable contributions combined with other acts can help you earn one. There's a limit of one plenary indulgence per sinner per day. (laughs) Per day? Wow. 
And there you go, that's funny, that was 67. That was four years after the Witch Act came in. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Mm-hmm. And now you know what it is. Now I know what it is. We've remembered the word. <laughs> it's not the word I thought it was. Ooh, an indulgence was part of the medieval Christian church and a significant trigger to the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> No wonder, it's what you, we were just talking about. Yeah. You can pay to be absolved of sin. Yeah, there's definitely a lot wrong there. Yeah, yeah it's not great, is it? I don't agree with that. No. I I don't claim to be a Catholic or a Protestant, no. but I don't agree with that system. No. That's very strange. So, how are we how are we rating this? Are we sticking with 17 coffins a la season 1? I mean, I think 17 coffins is better than executed witches. Yeah, I'd agree. So. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely agree with that. I don't want to rate it 200 executed witches out of 200. That's the sad thing. If you were going by the German scale, then it's 4, 400. 400, yeah. yeah. Or 100,000. Coffins? 17 coffins seems fine. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're listening to this, feel free to leave us a rating out of 17 coffins. Yep. I rate this one corrupt monarch out of one. <laughs> Uh, well, thus ends episode one. Thus ends episode one, but for the first time, you now have an episode to jump straight into. You do. Because we are releasing all three parts of this miniseries all at once. We are. So whereas, for once, I have to wait to see what happens next. But you'll, you can start right now. Yeah. Why don't you? Go on. Go. Come on. Go. 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 We're not even, even going to say goodbye. You no. should just jump straight in episode two. Yeah. You've heard the music at the end. You know how it goes. (laughs) Roll it!